All right, missed the first three minutes of recording. What I want to show you is that we have a tutor. I'm speaking for the benefit of the people watching the video. Strongly recommend talking to the tutor about homework problems and stuff like that. Also, we have something called Solo Learn. Well, we don't have it, but it's available to you on the internet. You can go to sololearn.com. You can log in with your uh, Raider email address. Then uh, once you're logged in, you can add Python to your courses. You ought to be able to see that. If you can't find it that way, just go back to the front page and then you see Python listed as a course there. So once I did that, once I went to the main page, this is looking a little bit different than it did when uh, I was looking at the other concept. What is Python? Your first program. There's a whole bunch of different things here. I'm going to skip what is Python. You might not want to. Hopefully everybody can. I hope you can uh, pick and choose what you want. So we're in basic concepts right now. Are you allowed to skip ahead? Anybody got this up and running? Does it show that you can skip ahead? Click on basic concepts. Nope, you're not allowed to skip ahead. What? All right. We'll step through it. I'm going to get us started on it. And uh, as I get us started on it, it's very plausible. I'm not going to read it carefully enough to answer the questions correctly. So let's see what happens. Python's a high-level programming language. Yep. It's very popular. Used by such organizations as Google, NASA, the CIA, and Disney. Ah, we got... Got the whole gamut there, the most powerful movie company and a whole bunch of sneaky organizations and Google, who are also kind of sneaky. Python is processed at runtime by the interpreter. So as soon as you hit the run, it goes through what's known as the interpreter. Sounds good. Python is a programming language. It comes with an editor tool, but that's not what it is. Idle is the editor tool. You could even call idle the development environment, but whatever. It's a programming language. All right, and then the three major versions of Python are 1, 2, and 3. Nobody uses 1. 2 is obsolete. 3 was invented like in the late 2010s, you know, before 2010. So it's been around for a long time. However, so much code was written in 2 that it's still out there. A lot of Python code uh, is compatible between the two, but a lot isn't. They are subdivided into minor versions. Code written for Python 3 is guaranteed to work on all future versions. Well, why didn't they say that when they did 2? Both Python 2 and 3 are used currently. This course covers Python 3. True of us as well. Python has several different implementations. The version used in this course, CPython, is the most popular by far. I believe that's what we run as well. And an interpreter is a program that runs scripts written in an interpreted language. Written in an interpreted language. And there's other interpreted language. JavaScript is another one. Alrighty, which of these is true? Python is 1.7 the most widely? No, I just said that it's the least widely. C Python is an implementation of Python. That's, that's true. true. Yep. And the Python code must always be compiled. Well, that's kind of sort of true, but it's not what they said. So I'm going to run with this. C Python is an implementation of Python. When you compile something, when you strictly compile it, it makes like a .app file or a .exe file. And that's not what Python does. Alrighty, your first program. First off, let's create a program that displays hello world. Well, this isn't a program, but it's a statement, just like you would enter into the shell. Print, parentheses, quote, hello world, exclamation point, end quote, in parentheses. They use apostrophes as their quotes. You can use either apostrophes or double quotes, whatever you like. You see me always use double quotes. Try it yourself. All right, so it popped up this little code editor here. If I zoom in, all the rest of the pieces of the editor disappear, but then you can see it. So print, parentheses, quote, you've seen this a million times, this syntax. And it even filled it in for us, but maybe that's because I'd already stepped through some of these. And then run. That's our output. Do we get points for it? How do we get past this point? Huh. 
save. Whatever. All right. Anybody spot how to go to the next section? Pardon me? You just go back and there's, there's a, an oh. arrow. Oh, we can just go back? Yeah, but in the, like in the, uh, where's that you're at? I am being totally stupid. Right there, you just click that. All right, I have to get back to that, so. I think it's, it's on the last, uh, on the cellular tab. What is wrong with me? Your third tab. I'm sorry? Uh, the third tab, like the tab right before this one. Uh -huh. it open, it's it's it it Back? It nope, nope. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> right. Sorry. Should not use an ex expletive. Right there. Oh, for Pete's sake. All right, I brought shame to my ancestors. I'm going to walk out of here. All right, I'm back. Okay, that was embarrassing. I'm so sorry, guys. For Pete's sake. All righty. Then I can go to the next one. All I had to do is close the tab. That's all I had to do. All right, fill in the blanks to print high. Print. Parentheses, quote, high. It's funny how they're switching between single and double quotes. I guess that's just to show you you can do it either way. Correct. The print statement can do multiple lines of text. Yeah, we know this. Try it yourself. Hey, I know how to get back to the other tab. All righty. So, hello world. Hello world. Spam and eggs. Run it. I didn't even have to type anything in. That made it pretty easy. And then go back to the prior tab. All righty. Next. Fill in the output to print, neat, neat, neat. Okay, there's a mistake here, or not necessarily a mistake, but we have the print statement, but we didn't have the closing parentheses. Achievement unlocked, flawless. All right, I'm feeling good about myself. All right, you get the idea. It's holding your hand and taking it from the ground up. Now, I haven't made it making any mistakes yet to see what kind of feedback it gives you. And if this is all like close your eyes and go to sleep, you know, then you don't have to do it. If it looks useful to you, please do it. Please do it. Right? And also, remember that I have a habit of giving you more information in the early chapters than the book does. With the idea that when we get back to it again in later chapters, it's going to seem old hand. But on the other hand, it means that I'm giving you a lot of information that's not in the book in the early chapters, right? So we're trying to hit the round running. That doesn't sound like I said that right. Ground running. We're trying to do that. But if you stumble, right, you have this tool, and you can talk to me, and you can talk to, the, uh, talk to Jairus downstairs. Like I said, don't get discouraged yet. Don't get discouraged at all, but just keep plugging at it. Simple operations. All right, we know how to do this. Numbers, that plus sign is called an operator. The values to either side of it are called operands. Here we say the spaces around the plus and minus are optional, but do make it easier to read. And you can always redo these. Just, I mean, you know, you saw that effectively I was redoing the first two that I'd already done. You'd think I would have remembered how to go back to the tab. Okay, what does this code print? Well, I don't need to run it in anything to figure it out. 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is a 6. Correct. Simple operations. 10 divided by 2 is 5. I'm feeling good about this. We know that stuff inside parentheses is done first. 3 plus 4 is 7. <coughs> Times 2 would be 14. If you're doing all integers like that, unless there's division involved, you get an integer result, right? So 2 times 3 plus 4 gives you an integer. In this language, the difference between integers and floats is not nearly as significant as it is in sum. 
In some languages, if you divide an integer by an integer and you get a fraction, like 3.5, it flat out rounds it down. You lose part of the data. Not in this case. Python's nice about that. So 10 divided by 2 is 5. What is produced by this code? Somebody tell me. 6.0? Yeah, because... No? Yes, because 4 plus 8 is 12, divided by 2. 6.0? Yeah, it's going to be 6.0 because it results in a floating point. When you divide, right, you can get a fraction. So it rounds it down to a floating point. And, you know, and if you get stuck, you can always go back to this code playground and type it in, or better even yet, right? 6 plus 6, I know I typed it in wrong, divided by 2, 6.0, right. So I double-checked my work. And we know what a minus sign in front of a number is. I'm not going to even read. The plus sign could also be put in front of numbers, but it has no effect in this. In other words, it's silly. All righty. So, we want to make this say negative 18. And this is more a thought problem than anything. But we know what they were talking about. They were talking about putting minus signs in front of things. So, minus 5, minus a 1 is, in fact, minus 6, times 3 is minus 18. So, in Python, the last line of the error indicates the error type. And then the line above that tells you what line number it is. So when y'all get an error and I'm wandering around trying to help you, I always immediately go here, hear what the error is, see what the error is. And, and you know, it doesn't always make sense. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, it may be written, you know, using terms we're not familiar with yet. And sometimes the error message isn't quite right. Sometimes the mistake is in the line above it. But anyways, and it'll tell you the line number. Now, in idle, it would be really nice if it showed you the line numbers down the side like some editors do. I wish Mr. Idle Programmer would do that. However, you can see the line number. It's kind of hidden for me here by the pop-up bar, but if you maximize it, you see line number 7. So if we get a line number on, you know, 4, I know to move the cursor up and down until it says line number 4, and I'm good to go. I know that's small print, but you see where it is. Drag and drop the answer that will cause a division by zero error. Well, minus 5 plus 5, five yeah. That will cause our divide by zero error. Achievement unlocked. All right, and so on. Start stepping through this. Right, this is all the early stuff. And what I mean by that is, you know, how it does math and what a variable is and things like that. Go ahead and work through this. We're well into the section where you probably could step through the basic concepts pretty quickly. After that, you ought to be able to go to control structures or functions and modules. Except it's not letting me because I haven't done it all right, but you can do take a shortcut, test out, <laughs> you can do that. I really thought you could uh, pick and choose what topic you were going to use. Just poke around on it and work through it step by step. I wanted to skip you all to a later step, but you saw I'm going through it more slowly than you will. That makes sense? I hope that those of you all who have been contacting me saying, you kind of leave me behind, dude. I hope you all look at that. Strongly recommend it. And there are other tutorials out there, but this one's free, right? And it looks pretty good to me. And it's the one that Donna Wilson uses as well. She's been using this while I was using Codecademy, and now that Codecademy seems, you know, like you have to pay for it. I'm switching to this one. Make sense, anybody? Anybody have questions over this? Now, that doesn't mean I want you to do that while I'm lecturing. That'll hurt my feelings, right?
But anyways, you get the idea. Okay, we've been talking about modularizations of program for a few days, and I'm ready to start skipping past a few slides to get past that section. Okay, declaring variables and constants within modules. I am going to make a new file. Looks like we're on lecture J. So I'm going to save this as lecture J in my favorite directory. I don't know if I've iterated this recently, but never save any programs into this Python 3632 directory. If you absolutely feel like you have to save something into that directory rather than putting it elsewhere, make a new folder underneath it. But it's far better to put it somewhere else, documents or a you know, folder off the desktop, <clears throat> something like that. You can easily break Python by saving stuff in here. Also, never save anything as math.py or turtle.py or any of the other modules we might use. If you do, then I'm going to have to walk back there and we're going to have to find the file and rename it or delete it. And if it's on your machine at home, it's a lot harder for me to do that, right? Okay. So, lecture J. All right. Define parentheses song, or excuse me, define song parentheses in parentheses colon print I love rock and roll. Kind of like we've done before, but now I'm going to create a variable. Line, like for line of data, the next line of the song equals, quote, put another dime in the jukebox baby, end quote, end parentheses. That's our module. You already know what a module is. I'm going to run it and notice that it doesn't do anything. And notice I even got invalid syntax. All right, it highlighted it. The problem is that I kind of forgot I wasn't doing a print statement, and so I stuck a closing parentheses on it. And I bet everybody typed that along with me. So we got to remove that closing parentheses there on that statement. That was not intentional, and you can't see it here. But if I scroll over, I can see it, right? And I know you can because your, your font's smaller. All right, so I'm going to run it again. It defined the module, but it didn't call it. Well, I'm going to call it song, parentheses, in parentheses, and there it goes. So we have declared a variable inside a module. Now, if we create another module, that variable is not supposed to be available in it because it's local to this one. It's like, you know, if I have a, you know, a TV in my house, then you're not going to be able to watch it inside your house. It's local to my house. So I'm going to define another one. DEF song two parentheses in parentheses colon and I'm just really bored so I'm going to print hum print hmm but then I'm going to try to print out that second line that was created up above so after print hmm I'm going to do print parentheses line in parentheses I'm going to try to print this variable out it should give us an error message Let's go ahead and put the calls to song and song two down here so it'll actually run them, right? So we don't have to run them from the shell like I was doing. Remember that when you're done defining a module, you got to backspace all the way to the margin. So song, parentheses, in parentheses, and then song, whoops, whoops, song two, parentheses, in parentheses. Run module, and there we go. Line is not defined. Why is it not defined? I see it bigger in life there. It's because it's inside this module. Anytime you're indenting and you create a variable inside there, it's not supposed to be available anywhere else. My Python's a little bit more loosey-goosey than what I just said, but as far as modules go, it's absolutely true. If you create a variable inside one module, you're not going to be able to access it in another. Now I'm going to show you a cheeky way. No, I'm not. I'm not going to show you a cheeky way of getting around that. Yeah, I guess I better. Remember when we had import turtle and then Q 
is equal to turtle dot turtle and stuff like that. We were creating a variable that was available to all modules. That's called <coughs> a global variable. And this is way beyond where the chapter is, so I don't care if it sinks in yet. But I'm going to create a variable called singer equals, quote, Joan Jett, because that's her song. Then I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to print the singer's name. Maybe before it prints, I love rock and roll. So print, quote, singer, end quote, comma, and then the variable name singer. That's kind of dumb. I don't like repeating the word twice, but it, it works. And since this line was an error message, I'm just going to comment that out. Don't like it there, going to comment it out. Quickest fix. If I cared, I'd go back and fix it somehow. <clears throat> There'd be an easy way to fix it. I should just move the declaration of it down below. All right, so that's working. This variable was defined outside of all the modules, so it's available inside of the modules. That's why we did that turtle t is equal to turtle business or Fred is equal to turtle, whatever we called it. And then we get access Fred from inside all of the modules. I'm not going to even make a note of it. I'm not going to call it a global variable yet, but I am going to put a comment. <clears throat> Since singer is defined here, it's inside, or it's available <clears throat> inside all the modules. I will give it a name. Why not? We're tough, we're cool, we understand it now. Global variable. <clears throat> then I'm going to go down under the line equals and I'm going to put another comment saying what it is. It's a local variable, so it's not available inside other modules. And it's too bad that it works this way in one small sense. It'd be neat to be able to write a module called get input and it asks all the questions, right? What's your height, what's your age, what's your name, and all that, and then have all that code, all the, that data available to your other module. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. All right, let's put our comment here. Line is a local variable available only inside this module. Then underneath print line, I'm going to add one more comment explaining that why that was a syntax error. That was a syntax error because line is local to the other module. That's also known as the scope of the variable. Anytime we understand something, we have to throw a more fancy term. The scope of the variable is the module, the function in which it's defined. The scope of this variable is that function. The scope of that global variable is the entire set of code. Anybody wishing that the syntax errors on their screen would go away? So, that covers that slide. You can put any statement within a module. You can put your input, your processing, your output. You can declare variables. You can declare constants. On the other hand, once you declare a constant inside a module, it's not available to the other ones, and it's probably not what you want, right? If you put the density of iron, you know, inside one module, you'd really probably want it to be available to the others. You should stick it up at the top of the code. So variables and constants declared in that module are usable only within the module. Visible. In scope, also called local. I was calling it local. 
I use the term in scope, and I guess visible is a good synonym for that as well, right? This variable is only visible inside this function. It's not a visible inside this function, which is why we got a syntax error there. So we have to have three definitions for the same thing. Local, visible, scope are kind of all synonymous terms. I don't want to say mean the same thing, but they all apply to the same idea, right? Portable. A portable module is one that's easily transported because it does not depend upon some other data, right? I could copy and paste that, uh, both of those modules and put them somewhere else, except for the fact that one of them refers to that singer variable, right? So if I cut the code that re involves the singer variable and I put it in another file, it's no longer going to work. So it's, that one's not very portable. So a global variable. That's one that's declared at the program level, meaning it's declared up above everything and it's not indented, right? So it's available throughout the code. It's visible to and usable in all the modules in the program. Yeah, here's the key. Many programmers avoid global variables to minimize errors. I kind of almost don't mind if y'all, I mean, yeah, just accept that as truth, but if you need to use them, use them anyways. I've used them every time we've done a turtle program because it's far easier to write a turtle program if you define it as a global variable. Technically speaking, it's a good idea to avoid global variables, kind of for the reason that I said, right? It makes your code less portable. You can't cut modules out and paste them in another. That's one reason. But on the other hand, when you become an object-oriented programmer, you take Java or C++ or something, or maybe we'll hit classes and objects towards the end of this one, then you wind up being able to put variables inside of classes and they kind of act like global variables. There we go. Here's our start and we have some declarations. It doesn't show how to declare a global variable. Okay, fine. And then, you know, the module also has some declarations. So the mainline logic of almost every procedural program does kind of something like this. You declare your variables, your global variables, and your constants. Then you have housekeeping tasks, stuff you have to do at the beginning of the program to get ready for it. We haven't done a lot of housekeeping, but creating the turtle so that we can make it start drawing is a housekeeping task. Then you have detail loop tasks, right? Stuff that you do in the middle of the program. We're going to make the uh, turtle draw flowers or whatever or we're going to add up all the numbers between 1 and 20, something like that, detail loops. And then end of job tasks, stuff that we do at the end of the program to finish the application. Now, we don't have any end of job tasks. You know, it just runs its loops, and then when we close the window, it's done. But later on, you might, we're going to be doing something that does have end of job tasks. Like if we open a file to write to it, our program better close the file. Right, just like Word, you know, if you type in all your, your data, but you don't save it, you don't close the file, then uh, when you, you close Word, if you didn't save it or your program turns off or whatever, you lose your data. So, housekeeping, data loop tasks, and end of job tasks, those are the terms that they want you to remember, in declarations. All right, creating hierarchy charts. The hierarchy chart shows the overall picture of how modules are related to one another. Now, I'm not going to ask you hardly any questions about hierarchy charts, but we're going to look at one. Say you had, well, why don't we just use our example. You have a main program, and it calls a housekeeping method 
function. Sorry, I called it a method. That's a object-oriented term. It calls a housekeeping module, then it calls a detail loop module, and then it calls an end of job module. But modules can call modules. Here's a main program. It calls housekeeping. What does housekeeping do? It calls get order. Here's the main program. It calls the detail loop, but the detail loop does a whole bunch of stuff. It calls process order, which calls check inventory, check credit, which calculates compute bill which even calls something else called compute tax. And then there's get order, which is called by detail loop. And then end of job and display summaries. Now this is not a float chart, right? It's not showing arrows going from line to line to line. It's a hierarchy chart, just like a hierarchy of a business, right? Chief executive officer, chief financial officer, you know, lowly peons. So something like that, right? You can even have a module that's used by more than one module, right? Compute tax might be necessary in more than one place. Say display summary also needs a compute tax. Well, we would have another box down here that says compute tax. Again, kind of looks strange to have the same module in more than one place. Again, that's not like flowcharting, right? Where we define a module in only one place. But the idea is, is that if I need to figure out what compute tax needs to do and who calls it, then I can look at a hierarchy chart and go, oh, I see, compute tax is called by that, which is called by that. So if I make a mistake, it may break that, it may break that, it may break that. I see what I need to test. And then if compute tax had also been called by display summary, I would know, oh, well, I've changed this one. I better change these. I better test these modules, make sure they work, but I also better test that column of stuff as well. So program comments, we know what the program comments are. You just use them to describe what your program's using, the hash symbols. Or if you're going to start a multi-line comment, you can use quote, quote, quote. Identifiers should be chosen carefully. Single, letter, variable names are kind of length. Fred is a silly name for a variable, but at least it's easy to type, and that's why I use it to give a turtle a name. You know, saying x is equal to you know, mass times density divided by velocity or whatever, I ought to actually put what that is supposed to contain. You know, what does it contain? I don't know, energies or whatever. I totally made up that equation, right? You know, but instead of p and r and h as your variable names, I would use a and rate and hours, right? That way when you're looking at the code, it actually makes sense. Strive to design clear statements. If your code goes off the edge of your editor, it's probably too long and you ought to find another way of breaking it up. Write clear prompts and echo input. Now we haven't talked about echoing input. I must have missed that slide. What is echoing input? It means repeating what they just typed in to make sure they got it right. Right before you, I mean, you're making an Amazon order, right? You, you choose your payment, you select your address, you know, and then it comes up to a screen that lets you verify all that before you go ahead and click place order, right? That's called echoing input. That way, I know that it's ready to go. Or, you know, our programs that calculate pay based on hours and stuff like that. It would be better if we printed that information out as well towards the end where we're going to display the total paycheck, right? So that if that total paycheck looks weird, my eyes can wander up a line or two and see, oh, I only typed in four hours rather than 40. So that's echoing your input. And then continue to maintain good programming habits as you develop your programming skills. So program comments, we know what they are. I'm just going to skip this slide. We know what syntax is. It's the format the language has to follow and the symbols, where you have to tab, where you have to put parentheses. We know what a flowchart is. A flowchart is a series of so-called annotation symbols, shapes, to hold information that expands on what is stored within another flowchart program. Oh, I kind of skipped that one. Annotation. Well, if they don't talk about it anywhere else in this uh, flowchart, I'm going to skip it. But if you have a question over it in the quiz, then uh, find it in the textbook. Are 
these annotation symbols. They look like notes to me. Notes are a form of annotation. I'm willing to run with that as a definition, but you may find a better one in the book. So the rate may go up on January 1. That's that common. The program assumes that all employees make the same standard hourly rate. Well, I don't know if that's a valid assumption, but that's why they put it in caps. They decided that rate was a constant, meaning it applies to all employees. Everybody at this company earns the same rate. How likely is that? I don't know. Not very. So your general guidelines, you're supposed to give the variables and the constants good names and names that are a noun because they represent things, height, weight, speed, velocity, density, hours worked, pay rate, all of those are nouns. And then you can give a module and an identifier that is a verb, calculate pay, get area, print results, that kind of thing, because it performs an action. If you use good names, the program becomes, quote, self-documenting, meaning you don't have to put as many comments in there. It's easier to read. Use pronounceable names. All right, x123 string, you know, whatever. Doesn't mean much. In Microsoft's internal source code, back before they developed better documenting processes, you'd see things like A, S, Z, you know, um, and then P, L, standing for an array of strings that are pointer lists. Something like that. That, that doesn't mean anything, right? Use pronounceable names. That way, when you're looking at the code, it's easy to understand what it's doing. Kind of be judicious in your abbreviations. Don't over-abbreviate stuff. You, you always want to use good variables, good variable names, and abbreviations can kind of make sense, but they may make it harder to understand. And avoid digits in a name. Well, I don't always do that, right? I may use A1 and A2 and A3, but if, if it makes sense to avoid digits in a name, go ahead. These are just guidelines. So use the system your language allows to separate words. We can use underscores to separate our words, like hourly underscore rate. Or you can do hourly rate, but with the R capitalized, right? Hourly rate, like that. That's one way to do it, as opposed to hourly rate. Now, this is more modern. A lot of programmers tend towards this. This is kind of what you saw in the 70s and the 80s. I like it because it's easier for y'all to type, meaning that when I'm wandering around, I don't see that half the people have typed a lowercase r rather than an uppercase r. But if you want to be more modern, if you want your code to look like it was written by somebody who learned programming, you know, in this decade or, you know, the last two decades, this is the style that you usually prefer. However, when you're naming consonants, people almost always use the underscores instead, and they make the letters all caps. Avoid confusing line breaks in your statements. Well, we haven't been using line breaks in our statements at all. What that means is what if you needed to calculate something like this? A is equal to 1 plus 2 times 3. Well, I'm not even sure that's going to compile. In some languages, it would compile just fine. But it says invalid syntax. We use the line break where it shouldn't. Now, sometimes you can get away with using line breaks in the middle of something. Print parentheses, quote, hello, end quote, comma, and then I could go to the next line. Don't necessarily type this. I'm going to probably delete it all. Bob. Now, I did put a line break there. I hit enter, and it didn't break the code. It actually works, but there's not much need for it to do that. If you absolutely need to add line breaks to code like that a equals 1 plus 2 times 3. I believe there's a symbol that'll do that. Is it backslash? Yeah, yeah, it's backslash. If you need to break something up into multiple lines, you can put backslash. That's the one above the enter key rather than below the question mark. I just about never do that. I would just keep typing, you know, until I get to the end, until I hit the margin, 
and then I might do that, right? Now my margins are set differently than y'all's. Y'all can type a lot more code in on a single line than I can. So I may use it at some point, but I really doubt it. By the time code gets that long, I would probably break it up into several statements. How could I do that? Well, I could calculate 2 times 3 first, right? Result equals 2 times 3, and then I could do result is equal to 1 plus 2 times 3, right? I mean, 1 plus result, whatever. Yeah, you're breaking the calculation up into several components. And if it's making the code easier to read to do that, then go ahead and do that. If you have some expression that's like got eight, nine different variables or whatever, then it's not a good expression to follow. Did we do the interest rate calculation in this class? I'm not seeing a lot of heads nodding, so we didn't. But it involves like four variables. Once you get past that point, you probably ought to break it down into multiple statements. You ought to calculate one thing and then the other and then the other, right? make a chain of things rather than make a whole long statement that's harder to debug, harder to understand conceptually. The smaller the individual lines are, hopefully, the easier the code is to read. Avoid confusing line breaks. Most modern programming languages are free form. Not this one. This one you have to have it tabbed, right and there's only certain times when you can go to the next line or you can use that backslash but anyways so make sure your meaning is clear and absolutely do not combine multiple statements on one line what do i mean by that it's possible in some languages you could do this a equals one plus two semicolon b is equal to a times three now i'm not even sure this will work in python because python is so picky yeah it actually did work and then we could do print a comma B, right? That works, but really we should be breaking it down like this because it's a lot more readable, right? So just because you saw me, the fact that you can put multiple statements on the same line if you can separate them by semi semicolons, doesn't mean I want you to do that. Similarly, we could have done that down here. We could have called song one and song two. Now, if you really feel dead set on, on using that in your code, I'm not going to count off, but just know that it's, it's considered pro, poor programming style because it's harder to visually understand what the program is doing. You should put every statement on its own line, and as a matter of fact, putting white space between statements to make them flow easier to read is a good idea. Now, I had a student who just thought that white space was the most horrible thing in the world, and he would go and delete you know, all the white space and that's fine. It made sense to him, right? I'm not paying him to do this stuff, so I, I, I didn't count off or whatever. But, yeah, whatever. White space makes code easier to read. Just like putting spaces between paragraphs, you know, when you're writing a multi-paragraph multi essay. Makes it easier to read. Or tabbing the first, you know, sentence of a paragraph makes it easier to read. White space is just where you've been hitting enter and tab, right? That's white space there. You can use temporary variables to clarify long statements. A temporary variable is like when I did this. A equals 1 plus 2. B is equal to A times 3. I'm going to get rid of those semicolons because although they don't break it, we haven't been doing that. Right? This is a temporary variable. It saves me from having to put that entire expression there. It doesn't get used later, but it holds something that's going to be then used like on the next line or two. So, you know, instead of writing one long equation to calculate, you know, your total pay, pay is equal, I, I could do this um, if I thought carefully enough about it. Um, rate times hours plus, and this is going to look really stupid, math.floor, don't type this. Hours minus 40 times rate divided by 2. That's the formula for time and a half. Expressed, you know, far more succinctly than what we have done in the past. I wouldn't do that. That's hard to read. Instead, I would do, you know, pay is equal to rate times hours. And then bonus, or if, 
hours is greater than 40, right, then bonus is equal to hours minus 40 times rate divided by 2, right. And then later on, I could do total is equal to pay plus bonus, right. Now, that's actually going to be a syntax error because I did not declare bonus in adequately. I should also do an else colon bonus equals zero, right? Because if our hours are not greater than 40, we don't get a bonus. Now, what does math.floor do? I goofed, I goofed that statement up. But just, just trust that by holding temporary variables, you can make your final calculation look a lot cleaner, and you can make it look a lot, and, and it's a lot easier to debug. We should also be echoing our input. We should be displaying what the pay was and what the bonus was and then what the total was so that they can see all that stuff. I wonder how many syntax errors I put in it by in all this editing. Yeah, rate is not defined and that figures. Okay, so we would ask the user for their rate, but I'm just going to put something in. Our rate is equal to 12.5, right? We earn $12.50 an hour. And then our hours is equal to 40. We work 50 hours is equal to 40. Hopefully this works. If it doesn't, I'm just going to comment all that stuff out. All right. I'm not even printing it out, but we could. We could add three print statements for. Why not? Print, parentheses, quote, rate equals, end quote, comma, rate, close parentheses. I'm going to do the same for hours and for bonus and for total and for pay, I guess. Print, parentheses, quote, hours equals, end quote, comma, hours, close parentheses. Then I'm going to do that for pay and bonus and total. So I have three more print statements to go. By the time I realize I have three more print statements to go, I may just decide to copy and paste because it's faster typing. So I'm going to copy it one of those lines and paste it three times. Now I'm fast at pasting because I hit Control V to do so. Paste, paste, paste. Whoops, that was lame. Paste, enter, paste, enter, paste, enter. Anyways, now that I have that, I'm going to change these variables. Hours. I'm going to change that to pay and pay. And then bonus and bonus and then total and total. And it'd be nice to have dollar signs in front of the pay rates, right, or whatever, but this output is not going to be nicely formatted, but it's not the real point of this lecture. I'm trying to show temporary variables and input echoing. I'll go back to the screen. Don't worry. But anyways, we see our input echo. We would have asked the user for the rate. We would have asked the, yours, the user for their hours. Then we would show them the temporary variables. Well, we earned that much that week. Our bonus was that. And so our total, our net, was that. Anybody else need typing time on this? Are we all good? So consider using a series of temporary variables to hold intermediate results. Instead of that equation that I had up there, that still would have been correct, but uh, a little bit better, but it's still wrong. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to delete that because it's so wrong and I don't want somebody to, to you know, come back and make fun of me later. But you get the idea. Sure, it was one line. It, it looked simple in that way, but it was hard to debug. We didn't get to see what the bonus was. We didn't get to see what the pre-bonus pay rate was. And this way we do. We get a lot more information out of it. So temporary variables are a good thing. They sound silly, but they're just variables that you're going to create, and they're only going to be used, you know, right below it. And then later on, we're not going to use it again, but that's okay. So, for example, sales commission equals square feet times price per foot plus lot premium times commission rate. 
Instead, we can use multiple statements. Here's our base property price, which is square feet times price per foot. And here, total sales price, which is base property price plus premium. And then the commission is equal to the total sales price times the commission rate. Now, that's a lot easier to debug because you could print out each step. You could print out the base property price. You could print out the total sales price. It'd be a good idea to echo your input and print out the price per foot and the premium and the commission rate as well. And then you could print out the sales commission. All that information on the screen would be a good idea. That's why your paycheck has more than one piece of information on it, right? Or at least, you know, when you go back and you look at it electronically or whatever, it tells you how many hours. And especially if they're doing deductions, right? You know, if you have, you know, whatever deductions, it better list them all. Otherwise, you don't understand why you earned what you earned. So writing a clear prompt and echoing input. The prompt is a message you display asking for the response. What is the temperature? How many kilograms to convert? And an echoing input is when you display that information that the user typed in. I've already talked about that, right? Just like on Amazon, just like when you're entering a purchase, before you click the purchase button, it displays everything about it. Your payment method, your shipping method, your, your address, your billing address, you know, your items. You know, it's all there so that you can, ver you can visually, you know, because it's a, lot, it's a drag, you know, if you make a mistake and it goes at a wrong address or you've chosen a wrong payment method or whatever. And we are done with this chapter, just about. Every program you write will be better if you plan before your code. Now sure, after you've programmed for a while and this stuff becomes second nature, you can just sit down and type, right? That's what I do. I just sit down and type. It doesn't look like I'm planning it. But really, it's because I've already taught these things in the past and I've already got a plan in my head for how it's going to work. That's what the flowcharts are for. That's what the pseudocode is for. And I know that none of y'all want to sit down and draw a flowchart before you write a program. But you can at least grab a piece of paper and draw big boxes, right? I'm going to input my variables and then list which pieces of data you need to solve the problem, right? I need my pay rate and I need the overtime you know, rate and, and all this kind of stuff. And so you can kind of just sketch out the, fl the uh, flow of the program using some boxes. You, you don't have to make it all with lines and specific shapes and stuff like that. So maintain your habit of first drawing flowcharts or writing pseudocode. Desk check your program logic on paper. I don't think we went over that. Do I want to take the time to do that? Yeah, I guess I will. Say I have this program. X equals 1. Total equals 0. While X is less than or equal to 3, colon, total plus equals X. And then print parentheses total, like that. That's a simple loop that adds up the numbers 1, 2, and 3. Now, why did I do that? Because I'm going to check it by hand. To check it by hand, I kind of need line numbers or something to indicate what step I'm at. I don't think I'm going to put the line numbers there, though, just because I'd have to add extra comments. But I am going to pop up another window so that I can write down the values that I am talking about. This would be a lot easier in a spreadsheet. I'm going to go ahead and crank up a spreadsheet for this. You don't absolutely do not have to do this for you know today's class. For complex logic, it's a good idea to desk check it to understand it. Now, honestly, I did not do this too much as a pro programmer. But anyways, here's our variables. We only have two variables. We have a variable called x, and we have a variable called total. Oh, by the way, I just wrote an infinite loop. It'll never print the total out. I made a mistake, and it was not intentional. It's just hanging out here, not letting me do anything. If somebody can spot my error, that'd be awesome. I don't know if anybody can. What did I do wrong? Why is it an infinite loop? Now, we've only talked about loops once or twice. But here's the key. Keep repeating this while x is less than or equal to 3. Does the x ever change? No. No, so that's broken. So the next line of code underneath here, under total, needs to be x plus equals 1. 
So add that if you're typing in the code. So an infinite loop is just when you've written a loop wrong and it never gets out of it because you never change the condition. The condition never becomes false. All right, so here's my little desk check. X is equal to 1. We set that. Next line of code. Total is equal to 0. We set that. Now, I'm not going to repeat every number every time. If the number doesn't change, I don't change it. Now we go to the next line. Is X less than 3? Well, no, it's not. It's a 1. So we go to the next line. Total plus equals X. All righty. Well, that means that X total increased by the amount of X, which was 1. Next line of code, x plus equals 1. That means we added 1 to x. What was x? It was 1. Now it becomes a 2. Then it loops back up here. x is now equal to 2. Is it less than 3? It sure is. So it repeats. Total plus equals x. Well, what is x now? And what is total now? All right, I'll phrase it. Somebody tell me what x is equal to at this point in the code according to our desk check. It's bigger than life on line six. Somebody tell me. Come on, guys. Y'all are being stubborn. x is equal to two at this point, right? And what is total equal to at this point? Well, when it last changed, it was set to line 5. 1, okay. And so total is plus equal x. That means take the total, which was 1, add x to it, and it becomes 3. Then the next line. x plus equals 1. That means that 2 gets increased to a 3. We're at the last line of the loop. We come back up here. Is 3 less than or equal to 3? It sure is. So we keep going. Total plus equals x. What does total become now? Because what is the value of x now? Now that we're going to be changing our total here. What is x equal at that point? Yeah, the last value of it was 3. And what was the last value of total? 3. Right, so it's 6. I hope that's making sense to more than the one person who's answering it. And then lastly, what does x become when we get to here? What was the next statement after total plus equals x? So what was x's last value? You are correct. And it becomes 4. Thank you. And so it loops back up. Is 4 less than or equal to 3? No, it's not, so it prints it out. That's called a desk check. You just follow the state of the variables. Each time they change, you write a new value down. That's the last time I'm going to do that in this class, but have that concept available in your head. And so, summary. Programs contain literals. Those are just the numbers, like x equals 1, 2, 3. The 1, 2, 3 is the literal. Variables and named constants which is a variable that's declared with uppercase letters that you know you're not supposed to change or that the uh, syntax gives you an error if you try to change it in the middle of the program. Arithmetic follows the rules of precedence. Multiplication happens before addition. Parentheses happen first. You should break down your programming problems into modules. Now Donna Wilson and I both agree that talking about modules in Chapter 2 is a bit of a pain. That's our, one of our big complaints about this textbook. But we'll hit the idea again, and we're going to keep hitting it over and over and over until it's burned in anyways. That hierarchy chart is like the CEO chart and the CFO chart and the peons underneath that person, right? Shows the relationship among modules. And as the program becomes more complicated, the need for good planning and design increases. And we are done with Chapter 2. And if you've taken the quiz for Chapter 2 already, that's totally cool. But I'm going to update the due date on it. Remember that these due dates are just to prod you to get them done. There's like 23, 24 people in the class. I see that nine people have taken quiz 2. 
That's fine because we hadn't finished it until today. Do try to get quiz two done by March 10th. And we're going to plow into chapter three, and then we'll have our exam after we're done with chapter three. And I'll make sure that we know the uh, date of the exam at least two weeks in advance. If you haven't taken chapter one yet, and I see that a lot of people have not gone in and modified, I mean, a lot of people haven't gone into the remainder and said that the, the reminder and said that they have. This is just a reminder, but you do, do get a bonus point of credit for, for going in and marking the reminder. If you haven't taken test one yet, please do so. We were done with chapter one quite a while back. So do chapter one and chapter two, and as a reminder, these mind tap tests, as annoying as they are, do play a, a significant portion in the final grade. Plus, they set you up for the exam really well. A lot of the exam questions are drawn from the mind tap tests. When you say quiz, you meant text, though, right? Or is there a difference? Well, it's called a quiz here because I can't change that text. Right. But there really are tests. Okay. And I know that this particular book has both quizzes and tests. You only have to take the tests. And I apologize for the confusing, the confusing yeah. terminology. Because uh, if you, I know in mind tap it has tests, and then I it don't want to spend a whole lot of time trying to find a quiz that doesn't. Right. If you look at it and it says counts for a grade, that's the one to zero in on. And the quizzes do not say count for a grade. If you've done the quizzes, then you really want them to be graded just to know how well you did, then send me a, a message and I'll grade it for you so that you know. But the tests get graded automatically. You can immediately see what you did and you can take it a second time. You can see your results before you take it again because don't just take it over and over and over and hope that by guessing you're going to get the, you know, the right answer. Instead, scroll through the answer, see which one you got wrong, look them up, and then take it again. There's no reason to accept a 70 or a 60 on one of these mind tap tests because you can take it again. Chapter 3. I sort of feel like ending the class a little bit early so that we could talk about homework, but on the other hand, I'm afraid that if I say that, everybody's going to leave. Does anybody have questions over homework that they'd be happy if we hung out an extra, I mean, if we ended class 10 minutes early to talk about it? Wave your hand. I mean, don't be embarrassed. Nobody's going to want to talk about homework? Then we're not leaving early. Do I see one hand? <laughs> no, I didn't. Fine. All right. We could also always hang out a little bit here, but I, I go and I teach another class immediately afterwards as well. Wow, we really are actually close to being done, though. I apologize. I forgot that uh, we get out of here at 1.50 rather than 2 o'clock. In that case, we're going to save Chapter 3 for next week. I mean, excuse me, for Wednesday.